the blockchain story, the next evolutionary phase of the internet. We'll be covering the history of Bitcoin, how Bitcoin works, how blockchain works, uh, some other details that will include the impact of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain on uh, industries and societies as a whole, and as a movement, and some of the uh, influencers in that space. So the history of Bitcoin started in 2008, uh, at least officially. Uh, Bitcoin.org domain was uh, registered. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's original Bitcoin paper is published. And the Bitcoin project is registered at sourceforge.net, which is a public repository of software, public software that's freely reusable. <clears throat> the uh, Bitcoin uh, software uh, from a more of a activism perspective was uh, really published as, as a response to a solution to problems in financial system after the 2008 financial crisis. So it's more than a piece of software. Uh, it's uh, really a um, software that is, uh, can take the, <clears throat> the place of um, third party intermediaries for uh, exchanging value um, Bitcoin uh, in specific, but blockchain can be used for any uh, any type of uh, value or asset that uh, can be reliably stored and exchanged. So in 2009, um, beginning of 2009, the uh, Genesis block is established on 3rd of January. Um, at 1815 GMT. Um, of course, that's all recorded on the, on the ledger, so um, that's one of the properties of um, blockchain technology of having an immutable ledger, um, regardless of um, uh, how this software is deployed and where. Uh, so the first client, um, Bitcoin client, uh, called Bitcoin D version point one is released. First Bitcoin transaction is performed in block 170 from Satoshi Nakamoto to Hal Finney. First difficulty increase occurs in December 30th of that year uh, from 1.0 to 1.18 in block 32 to 56. Uh, difficulty uh, increase really has to do with um, uh, how much computing power is required to uh, uh, to get to produce a block and post it to the uh, blockchain ledger. Uh, and that increases over time um, according to the program schedule in the software. Uh, and which is tied to the reward of uh, Bitcoin being uh, issued or minted to uh, the block producers. Um, and, and that is essentially a built-in monetary policy for, uh, for the uh, Bitcoin network and the uh, controlling the money supply to the software algorithm rather than <coughs> a you know, arbitrary or subjective decision uh, by uh, human intervention. So 2010, the first Bitcoin currency exchange site is created, uh, Bitcoin market. Uh, OpenGL GPU hash farm is established uh, for uh, for mining blockchain 
established by Art Forks, and GQ mining begins the volume. Vulnerability in Bitcoin is exploited to generate 184 billion uh, Bitcoins. The bug is quickly fixed. Um, gold mining begins in 2010. Um, 2011, um, the third year into the project, Bitcoin reaches parity with the US dollar for the first, for the first time. So this is uh, the evaluation of uh, when Bitcoin is exchanged from, uh, from a conventional currency like US dollar to BTC, um, that valuation continues to increase from the initial um, value in uh, 2009 of being near zero. Uh, and as the, since it's a limited supply that uh, affects the price and which is reflected in 2011 um, by reaching that parity with uh, US dollar being um, same value as one Bitcoin. Uh, Generating Bitcoin difficulty passes 1 million for the first time in June 2011. Uh, the first Bitcoin conference and the World Expo is held in New York City that year. In 2012, the Bitcoin Foundation was established in September of that year. Uh, first Bitcoin halving day is observed on the 28th, 4th block. Uh, 210,000 having a block of order. 25 BTC. Uh, Bitcoin halving really uh, means that uh, the number of Bitcoins that are created for each uh, uh, block that's created uh, on the chain um, was cut in half, which means it's a diminishing supply for um, programming to the uh, software over time, which is part of the uh, monetary policy. Um, the next scheduled halving day um, was then to be observed in 2016 when the block reward halves to 12.5 ETC and block 420,000. 2013 hard fork of reference declined uh, 0.8 occurs on network updates within a few hours. So uh, that's to do with a with a um, client software that interacts with the uh, with the network, and that was that was just a basically an upgrade uh, upgrade of uh, in the uh, client software, which is basically um, a wallet uh, for for storing. Um, Keys that can access um, the Bitcoin by, by the owner of the keys. Uh, the total Bitcoin market capitalization that year in 2013 exceeds uh, 1 billion US dollars. Bitcoin mining difficulty passes uh, 1 billion in uh, December 2013. Um, 2014, uh, the Bitcoin mining difficulty passes 35 billion. Um, so basically, that uh, was referring to the number of um, the, the hash rate that's required to be able to, to mine a block. So it requires increasing uh, requirement of computing power uh, to be able to, uh, to mine. Uh, which of course uh, adds to the cost and of, of mining and reflected in the Bitcoin price. Uh, 2015 um, sees uh, NASDAQ announcing blockchain-based platform NASDAQ LINQ for private securities issuance. Uh, New York State releases a license which outlines the rules blockchain startups should follow within the state. Uh, basically, an attempt for um, for governmental agencies uh, to to regulate um, the, uh, the Bitcoin space, uh, which had some 
some mixed results, some mixed successes. Uh, Bitcoin is exempt from uh, value added tax according to rules imposed by the European Court of Justice. Um, <clears throat> that was an important uh, milestone as well. Uh, Bitfinex, uh, the uh, Bitcoin exchange was hacked uh, that year as well. And 119,756 Bitcoins were sold. Um, that uh, started to to bring to light more of the uh, uh, the difference in what a uh, free um, monetary system looks like versus a highly regulated monetary system. Uh, 2016, the Open Bazaar is released in April as the first decentralized marketplace accepting Bitcoin as a payment. Uh, In uh, 2017, um, sorry, 2016, uh, Craig Wright privately claimed to be Satoshi Nakamoto by explaining a private key signing attempt, attempting to present it as Satoshi's keys. Uh, and that was uh, because Satoshi Nakamoto was a pseudonym name, uh, so it was meant to be. Uh, kept anonymous for um, probably various ideological reasons, um, among other things. In July 9th, 2016, the second halving occurred as the block reward was reduced to 12.5 bitcoins per block. Uh, the largest bitcoin exchange by volume uh, to date uh, was was hacked uh, in 2016. That was the uh, the Colonel Sophie Mount Cox um, um, incident, uh, which became a fairly uh, sort of a watershed in uh, in how the evolution of the currency continued from there. Uh, it did have effects later. Uh, because uh, that exchange I mentioned went bankrupt, and and the uh, the bitcoins that were recovered, uh, quote unquote, were then gradually released back into the uh, into the network, um, but sort of unofficial at least. But that had an effect then later at, on the. At least according to speculation on the price uh, of Bitcoin as it uh, um, went past its peak in 2017. So 2017, Bitcoin broke the $1,000 mark uh, in early January, uh, first time since 2014. Uh, Japan categorized Bitcoin as a legal tender after long disputes between regulators and crypto exchanges. That was another important milestone. Uh, Bitcoin Codes but initiated Bitcoin Cash in August 1st with the aim to support blocks of up to 8 megabytes. Uh, block size was uh, uh, important uh, for the reasons of uh, getting better performance uh, because that was one uh, drawback with Bitcoin City. Uh, was not able to scale uh, very uh, well at all. Uh, being the throughput uh, essentially is about seven transactions per second uh, as a global network, that's nowhere near what it needs to be to be able to handle um, transactions.
infections across uh, across the globe, uh, comparing that to Visa, MasterCard type of um, processing, which are in the range of uh, peaking at uh, 30, 40,000 transactions per second. So that, um, <clears throat> that was um, part of the, and still is part of the evolving um, um, characteristics of, uh, of the network. And, and there is then a solution that was uh, devised uh, to, to address that, which I will talk about later. Um, but essentially, it's a solution that's a second layer um, on top of Bitcoin that securely can transact much faster and much cheaper and with smaller uh, amounts. And that project is called the Lightning Network. In 2018, uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter um, banned crypto advertising to protect investors from ICO scams. So ICOs, uh, initial coin offerings, became a big um, thing with the rise of the Ethereum network, which supported um, uh, creating of, like new specialized coins on top of that network, and uh, <coughs> and a whole. Um, uh, almost the industry um, emerged uh, from that, at least, and attracted a lot of uh, um, a lot of players that were uh, fraudulent. Uh, more than eighty thousand of the total, eighty percent of the total Bitcoin supply had been mined by January twenty eighteen, uh, and. That year, the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission says crypto exchanges must register with the agency as exchanges. So that was the onset or of a continuation of um, uh, regulating exchanges, at least in the U.S. But because Bitcoin is a, a global network, uh, regulation was not consistent across uh, different geographies. So. Um, <coughs> Some exchanges that uh, had uh, found regulations too restricting. Uh, probably one that's the most prominent uh, uh, exchange and also the largest um, was uh, originally, I believe, in Japan or uh, Singapore, um, or maybe, yeah, I think so. Was, um, uh, Binance, and uh, because of regulatory uh, pressures, it actually ended up moving uh, its headquarters and uh, its operations from there to Malta, uh, which is in uh, Mediterranean, and it was a, uh, a friendly jurisdiction for, uh, for uh, cryptocurrency operations and uh, cryptocurrency space. Uh, so that that is basically what seems to be happening with um, at least with exchanges uh, to some extent where uh, jurisdictions that are not friendly uh, or have make it too difficult to operate uh, may drive away um, operators into other jurisdictions that um, are more open to <coughs> to the cryptocurrency space. So Bitcoin is uh, based on a technology called uh, referred to as blockchain, which essentially is um, blocks of data that are chained together uh, to uh, link uh, security together to to form a, an immutable uh, um, data storage database. And um, so the way that works is um, um, the technology itself, blockchain technology, 
uh, enables a number of different things. Um, but what it is, first of all, is uh, some native technology on the internet. It's a centralized database uh, hosted on decentralized computers. Um, it's a peer to peer network, it's shared um, with a distributed ledger, which is what the um, which is uh, stored as blocks. Uh, it's a trust layer for the web uh, that allows um, uh, all of the allows the web to have a place to have to store data securely uh, with no reliance of intermediaries, uh, whether it's administrators or other third-party authorities. Um, and it's a software development environment, uh, at least a uh, development that's that um, <clears throat> for for the software uh, for creating um, a software that's uh, blockchain based. It's probably could be better described maybe in, even as a software development methodology. Um, so it has to follow certain rules and has to um, show specific characteristics to make it what it is. So what that uh, enables is uh, enables the creation of real-time movement of uh, digital assets on the network. Uh, and now it's debating of trust rules inside transactions and transactions. Uh, it allows the time stamping and rights and ownership uh, proofs. Of, um, of transactions and, and data. Um, it allows for identity ownership and representation um, to, because of its immutability characteristic. Uh, its resistance uh, it allows a resistance to single points of failure or censorship um, because it's distributed. Uh, it allows the creation of uh, a cryptocurrency market, um, <clears throat> which uh, enables the exchange of value and also the, um, a medium of exchange and a store of value. Uh, as for self-execution of physical business logic with self-enforcement, um, essentially software-driven. Uh, running of decentralized services, uh, which is uh, the self-execution of business logic and self-enforcement essentially is termed the smart contracts um, and I mean that as a decentralized service um, that's implemented in the Ethereum network. Uh, it allows selective transparency and privacy so that is um, implemented in different ways depending on what uh, network it is because there's you know the the first implementation was bitcoin of course but there's many others after that um and each one uh has various degrees of uh, privacy and transparency so the impact of of that uh enablement um is that um, it uh, allows for across many industries, most industries, um, the re re-engineering of processes, rethinking of roles of intermediaries um, because of the fact that the software is not reliant on them in the traditional sense, uh, bundling of services, new flows of value, uh, similar to uh, the way the internet to uh, uh, uncover new flows of information. Uh, this really applies to the notion of value and how it flows compared to the traditional um, conventional ways. Um, allies for, uh, yeah, in fact, the decentralization of governance um, and new legal and regulatory frameworks. This is a primer on 
um, what um, makes up a, uh, a distributed ledger or a blockchain database. There's two primary characteristics. There's the immutability uh, and the consensus mechanism. Uh, there's a few secondary ones, but those are the really the essentials. Um, we'll talk about the, both of these uh, briefly. But before we do that, um, the, the concept of uh, the digital signature is something that uh, is important in all of this and which has been around for, you know, for uh, in use for quite a long time, uh, probably the last um, uh, 20 years or so, um, being used today in, in uh, uh, on the internet, like um, web servers to establish secure connections uh, with browsers and things like that. But it's very much uh, a core part of the digital ledgers because um, the, uh, <clears throat> the way the blocks are, are linked together is to uh, by having a uh, lot signed links and those sign signature are essentially digital signatures that, uh, have, that have been used for for a long time for other purposes. So how does a digital signature work? Well basically a digital signature is simplest description is it's a hash um, of data any file message that's subsequently encrypted with the signer's private key. Um, so generating a hash is a, is a basic function for for um, representing a piece of data um, in a short string, uh, and that can be used to verify the integrity of the source data. Um, so <clears throat> since the digital signature is something only the signer has, um, that's where the trust comes in. Um, Everyone has, should have the access to the signer's public key uh, that's freely distributed. So, um, uh, to validate a digital signature, the recipient's software calculates a hash of the same data. Uh, so, that's the, the first part. Um, it um, decrypts the digital signature. Um, so, that's the, that's the second part. So, the first part. Um, just to uh, to um, go over that again, the data is uh, passed through a hash function, so that uh, hash function is then encrypted using the signer's private key, and that becomes the signature. The signature essentially is an encrypted hash, and uh, that signature has uh, with it a certificate, um, and that certificate, uh, which is attached to the data becomes then the data that's digitally signed and sent um, and can be verified uh, by, by anybody that has the uh, public key. So the validation of uh, the digital signature um, by the recipient calculates the hash of the same data, uh, this on the left here. and. Um, and then it decrypts the digital signature using the sender's public key, it's on the right, um, which produces um, the same hash if, if it's had been altered. And, uh, and then it's compared to see if the hashes are the same. And if they are, then the, uh, the data is valid. Uh, and if they're not, it's been compromised. So that, uh, is the flow of a and the um, details of the digital signature, um, and that and they play a key role in the blockchain technology and distributed ledgers because each transaction is signed by the current owner, authorizing transfer to the next owner, forming a chain of transactions over time. <clears throat> Thank you.
Okay, so what is immutability? Immutability means that something is unchanging over time and unable to be changed. Once data has been written to the blockchain, no one, not even a system administrator, can change it. And, and that's, that's a key property. So how is that done? Well, two relevant properties of a good hash function are it's hard to back calculate the original data from the hash, and if the input data changes in the slightest, the hash changes in an unpredictable way. And so hashes are the basis of the security and immutability for blockchains. So um, that's where the immutability property comes from using hash functions. For each block refers to the previous block's hash, not a sequential number. And that's important uh, because that's what links the blocks together and makes them makes the entire blockchain immutable. So data in the blockchain is in, internally consistent. That is, you can run some checks on it, and data and the hashes must match up. So how do hashes work? Uh, basically. You take a piece of data, um, you, apply a, you apply a cryptographic function to it, or which is a hash function, and it outputs a essentially a unique piece of data that's always the same length, uh, but it's uh, unique to uh, only occur uh, for the corresponding data that, that was being hashed. So if you take another piece of data, that data and make some modifications to it, you can apply a crypto function, you get a completely different hash value, um, unpredictable hash value. So since they don't match anymore, you have proof that the data has changed, or on the other uh, end of it, you can enforce uh, by checking the data against the original hash and preventing from uh, making a change or, or you know, allowing a change uh, to occur, uh, which keeps the data consistent, reliably consistent, and that's the that's the basis of uh, achieving that immutability property. So when you put that together, uh, immutability in uh, form of hashed blocks, um, <clears throat> these are then, uh, as I said, linked together uh, from the current hash to the previous hash. And current hash would be a, what's called a transaction root, which has a a tree of hashes in that block, and and then the previous hash is also um, captured in the current block, so that you always have a path back to the previous block. So you get a, that way you get a uh, an immutable order of in what of the sequence of uh, how the blocks are being added. Um, together and, and uh, kept in the same order. So the other property that defines a blockchain or distributed ledger is consensus. Uh, in the consensus protocol uh, is agreed by all participant members of the of a network. Uh, and ensures the ledgers update only with network verified transactions. So the immutability, those checks that are made uh, in a network of nodes, each node does their own check and then uh, <clears throat> use a protocol that verifies uh, and checks with other nodes that uh, they get the same result. Uh, and that provides the basis for an agreement uh, that uh, 
the data is consistent across the entire network. So how is consensus done? Consensus models, they vary by implementation. There's different styles and types depending on what kind of implementation it is. Bitcoin was the first one and used the consensus algorithm called proof of work, which required each node to form a series of um, calculations, essentially uh, trying to find the, uh, uh, the source data uh, by by just iterating uh, through uh, through a loop mechanism, essentially to find uh, the data that originally uh, created the hash, and uh, that's very computer in intensive, but it's very secure um, in a public network. The proof of stake is another um, consensus protocol that uses um, um, actual um, stakes or um, security deposits, you could say, uh, by node operators that uh, gives an incentive to validate the um, transactions um, honestly and uh, and with accuracy, uh, because they have a stake in them doing that. Basic voting is another, which is uh, usually only used in private network because you already have, uh, you don't have to be as strict with the validation because you already have uh, known players that are part of the network. So when a node is asked to check the validity of a transaction, it has to do several things. Uh, the main things are you check the schema of the validation, make sure that the format is correct, uh, check for double spending uh, so that the same transaction uh, from a particular um, <coughs> uh, key or ownership wasn't uh, used more than once. Uh, check the hash validation, make sure it's calculated. Uh, uh, consistently calculated uh, for a transaction. And any validation of fulfillments that are conditions that have to be met for the transaction, these are sort of basic, uh, uh, some basic um, functions uh, for, for doing conditional transactions. So the precursor of a smart contract, but uh, just in simple sequential form, including validation of cryptographic signatures, uh, which is uh, part of the validation process as well. Um, so majority of, when the majority of nodes uh, have the same result with validation, then it's considered successful. And then it's added uh, to the chain. So consensus uh, is um, uh, evolving as with uh, pretty much all areas of uh, blockchain technology and uh, distributed ledgers. Um, the uh, started out with the basic cryptocurrency uh, consensus mechanism uh, and expanded more varied uses with ledgers and contracts and then entire markets. So it's uh, expanding in scope in, uh, in what consensus means. Uh, but uh, it includes, it, it uh, encapsulates uh, more and more types of uh, assets and uh, types of data that's um, the data that needs to be treated as assets. So record ownership for things like land, stock, shares, energy units, et cetera, music, um, digital rights, uh, complex agreements between one user and another, which are smart contracts, 
they're matching with buyers and sellers to execute contracts. Um, <clears throat> so those are just areas in where our consensus is evolving into uh, greater scope of use. So cryptocurrencies are a special case of digital assets with the properties, medium of exchange, store of value, and unit of account. Those really define uh, when a uh, uh, currency, per se, in, in really any currency, but in cryptocurrency, these properties have to be true. So um, how is that done? Uh, create a digital asset that is fungible, uh, means it has a distinct unit, and is divisible, so that the defined units can be exchanged, transferred from one one to another. Uh, so that's uh, one property. Uh, fungibility must be immutable to store value. Uh, that's, of course, worth any uh, digital ledger, but especially also cryptocurrencies. Uh, can act as an account uh, to keep the ledger of value units. So the, the concept of account uh, really is essentially a, um, an accounting concept that uh, is uh, implemented in a digital form with uh, in in the ledger. <clears throat> so the smart contracts, uh, what are they? Um, they're basically a protocol coding conditions that must be met to complete predefined transactions in a distributed ledger. Now, uh, they're really actually, well, they can be treated as essentially programmable documents. Uh, so the documents that have programmability built into them and using blockchain as uh, a way to enforce uh, the uh, contract conditions, the inputs and the outputs, uh, and so on. So the implementations, you know, they, they vary. Uh, most well-known smart contract platform is Ethereum, which has a Turing complete language called Solidity. For smart contracts, there are other implementations that exist in other blockchain networks. Uh, Stellar is one. Uh, Sidechain has uh, one that's uh, being developed. Um, there is actually some limited uh, capabilities for smart contracts in Bitcoin, but uh, it's not widely used. Like it's quite difficult to program. Um, but the concepts for smart contracts essentially are that uh, supports multi-signatures, so keys that are needed to authorize a certain operation um, can be involved multiple people with uh, multiple key ownerships. Uh, batching and atomicity uh, involves the operations that must all occur together or fail together. Uh, so there, um, there are ways to basically build conditional branching that um, that um, defines a, a set of steps that have to be completed, and if one or more of those steps um, fails, then the entire uh, process fails. <coughs> uh, that's something that's used in enterprise and banking uh, uh, processes uh, has been used for many years. But this is an application and this property is uh, um, used in smart contract uh, concepts. The sequencing, uh, the order of the series of transactions to be processed can also be programmed and enforced in a smart contract. And time bounds basically means the transaction has to be processed within a certain time limit. If they are not completed, then essentially it uh, rolls back everything. So um, that's another uh, feature that defines a uh, a contract. <clears throat> so in uh, in digital ledgers, uh, there's a concept called token economics, and token economics can be essentially provide a way to 
uh, keep track of, of value, uh, added value and consumed value in a, uh, in a network. And it can be uh, codified and, and uh, tracked through the two units of value, which essentially are referred to as tokens. So currencies and tokens are kind of synonymous in that way. Uh, so value exchange really is what it's about and, and how the, uh, the rules around that are, um, are being defined in a network. Uh, so how is it done? Uh, we have to create fungible asset with the initial fixed quantity. Uh, which is basically money supply. Uh, there can be uh, certain activities that uh, can be built into the uh, into the network that incentivize uh, uh, stakeholders and participants to add value to the network uh, with token rewards, uh, like node operators that pay a fixed number of tokens for each validation transaction. Essentially, in Bitcoin, that's what's done by the miners. Uh, they, when they validate a block and add a block to the chain, uh, they reward it. Um, fixed number of coins for that. Uh, so that's an example of token economics. Uh, key management service providers can be paid a fixed number of tokens for each key access. Uh, this is something that uh, is um, a way to to do key management, sort of in more of a um, in a consortium environment, which is not necessarily a public chain, but can be. Uh, and and there's a key management system that uh, provides a uh, key management service, and to compensate for that service, um, the uh, tokens uh, can be introduced that. Uh, right away to exchange value of storing keys versus uh, using consuming keys. Uh, the token price discovery is basically uh, happens through a supply demand dynamics. Uh, it can be also uh, governed to some extent depending on uh, what the, the governance policies are for a network. Um, but uh, that can be either set to a fixed price, or it can be um, can be set to a let the the market determine the price to a open market system, which is typically more a public uh, public chain. So why is a blockchain technology such a big deal? Uh, other than you know the I mean, apart from the technical uh, descriptions showing these unique properties, which are novel to you know to the technology, um, what what does it mean exactly? So there's uh, definitely have there's big significance uh, and attention being given to that from from uh, virtually all areas of. Uh, Society and economics uh, to solve the fundamental problem of digital trust across uh, boundaries, um, whether it's uh, um, national boundaries, um, enterprise boundaries, uh, or wherever there's a um, environment that's that's closed essentially. Um, so, World Economic Forum and blockchain protocol technology is one of the ten emerging technologies in 2016. Um, it's evolving in a new phase of the internet from the internet information to the internet of value. Uh, web of assets is a term that's been used um, to describe what is emerging, uh, interacting with a cryptographically secure manner of uh, all different types of systems and devices. Um, so essentially, it's uh, it's kind of like an operating system of value that uh, uh, also referred to as the world computer by um, uh, which is comes from the Ethereum network. 
So putting it in, in context between uh, what has taken place when the internet uh, first emerged, which essentially is a uh, network of information versus the blockchain technology emergence, which is uh, uh, about um, oh, uh, 25 years later, or 20, 20 years later. Um, there are similarities. Um, it solved a set of serious problems. Initially, uh, there was the exponential growth of disconnected computers, proprietary vendors, serious problems with innovation, diverse non standardized systems, and basically having siloed data. Uh, so, the technologies that emerged from that, uh, that solved these problems, are a uh, set of protocols uh, TCPIP. Uh, which is the basic uh, network protocol that's used now across all, pretty much the uh, majority of networks. Um, the POP SMTP is, this, is an email protocol for email communication that's, that was uh, adopted across you know, all email systems. HTTP protocol is uh, adopted in this, essentially this protocol that's on top of uh, TCPIP, and it, uh, um, it's a protocol that uh, uh, communicates between uh, uh, computers, computer uh, browser software, and and, uh, and servers that are uh, web servers. Uh, and of course, then the uh, URLs and DNS, which DNS stands for domain name, domain name system, so it gave Computers uh, more user friendly names rather than having a set of numbers you can define them as, as names. Uh, and that was then uh, deployed with the universal resource locator protocol, which, which allows um, um, computers to find servers uh, by, by name and routing. The data accordingly, which of course the web browser was was a key piece of software that uh, allowed that to uh, to happen. With the, uh, the web service being on the other end, and that opened up a uh, collaboration between private sector, government, academia, and various institutions that collaborated on developing common internet architecture, uh, internet-based applications like email. Web, and they're all starting to deploy that, uh, which then uh, became a network effect to uh, roll out across all areas. <clears throat> so this uh, there's some parallels to that now with the uh, solving set of problems again that are in a different domain but have to do with uh, uh, another type of specific type of data assets. Uh, so these problems include uh, data breaches, uh, large scale fraud through exposure of, uh, of uh, systems that, uh, that are centralized um, and have critical points of failure, uh, increasing costs of data security, uh, aging corporate systems, data structure silos and so on. So these uh, problems are now um, what is uh, the response to, to that is the, the uh, um, is from emerging uh, technology solutions that uh, um, if to address these. And these include advances in photography, uh, distributed computing, new mathematical models, um, uh, things like game theory, uh, trustless interactions between parties that don't have intermediaries. Um, and that's so now this the similar kind of uh, um, process is happening now with core media awareness, uh, growing number of institutions with many sectors. 
they're ready to collaborate. And that's an ongoing, um, ongoing development uh, right now. So some use case examples that uh, among many are cross-border consumer transactions, uh, which uh, improvements in cost and speed, um, notarization of legal documents, um, microfinance uh, applications, crowdfunding, uh, international bank payments, supply chain, high value goods, infrastructure project financing with smart contract applications and so on. Uh, and these are just to scratch the surface, there are many more. Um, the uh, emerging blockchain standard uh, standards are now in, in place. Uh, the Linux Foundation has been instrumental in uh, all along with the with the internet uh, and now is also adopting standards through the uh, things like the Open Ledger project to Hyperledger uh, supported with IIM. Um, and there's uh, a number of sub projects that come from that and others uh, emerging standards that, uh, that are being developed and uh, collaborated on. Um, the uh, Ethereum platform is a uh, is one of the, the early uh, systems after Bitcoin that have uh, started to basically um, go into the second generation of uh, blockchain technology, and they are now. Uh, uh, starting to emerge third generation uh, technologies that uh, build on or improve on the, the original. Um, so these are uh, basically the engineers of software technology working on all these different areas include digital currency platforms, borderless payments, decentralized bank solutions, Third party clearing houses are eliminated through, uh, um, through the technology, uh, regulatory compliance automation, support for IoT automation, smart contracts, full life cycle asset, um, <clears throat> uh, full life cycle asset tracking, uh, which helps to, uh, to guard against. Uh, uh, fraud, digital identity validation uh, without third party, which there is a uh, because digital identity, there's a um, there's standard that's been uh, worked on, which is basically called self sovereign identity, which provides a way for uh, identities to be to be captured on a, on a blockchain network um, and uh, and have immutability. Uh, for basically any identity, so it kind of ties together, it tends to tie together um, identity data that's uh, currently sitting in many different silo systems from government to corporate uh, systems to um, um, technology companies, social media, and so on. Uh, basically, uh, it uh, Brings the ownership of the data back to uh, the control of the ownership back to the, uh, the actual owners of the data, uh, and that's a that's a a huge um, development that's uh, uh, emerging currently. I'm just going to touch on a couple more things before we wrap up. Um, so the, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin has some challenges which are being addressed to some key projects that, uh, that are um, helping to uh, move it towards mainstream adoption. One is called the Lightning Network. Uh, 
the, the layering network, essentially the second layer network. Um, that uh, runs on top of Bitcoin, but it's actually not uh, directly uh, tied to Bitcoin because it can be used with other uh, uh, currencies and platforms that interact with others, uh, including uh, Litecoin and uh, um, some of the other ones that are um, that may either are adopting or starting to or looking at adopting uh, that uh, protocol and that um, second layer that enables uh, the uh, the scaling up of of the network. Um, so. The, the solution essentially involves uh, rules that are built on top of the, uh, the network, specifically designed to facilitate micropayments, uh, where that network is considered the layer two solution. And the concept was uh, originally introduced by the Davis Dreja uh, and Joseph Kuhn back in 2015. Uh, and those two uh, young developers significantly advanced approaches for original design by forging a decentralized network of lightning fast transactions. So the network elements uh, simply is are capable of connecting any and all users to this fast and, and feeless system through a routed series of transactions. In other words, with this solution, you can get all the benefits uh, without its drawbacks. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, basically, uh, if you uh, transact with, with someone uh, that you know, you can open an off-chain payment channel between them. Um, and then from there, any number of transactions can be directly occur between uh, the two parties. Um, if it can be transferred quickly, as users follow to communicate over the network directly with each other, rather than going through the, through the chain. <clears throat> now this requires that they for the, uh, the security deposit on the network, uh, which is then reconciled once all the transactions are um, are ended, or when, once you uh, close out the channel, essentially. Um, and this can be done with with multiple parties, even but each one has to uh, put a uh, security deposit. Uh, down to be able to participate. Uh, it does provide some, it does pose some limitations in that you have to, you know, you have to open security uh, uh, channel each time you want to uh, transact with, with somebody. So, um, so the solution was uh, uh, put together for that by essentially being able to have uh, transactions that are routable. Uh, between channels and find essentially um, um, support a network of channels that uh, you can access from from any entry point that uh, that you uh, any known entry point, and then from there can route the transaction to uh, destination, um, and that uh, opens up. Um, the, you know, the abilities to basically inter interact across pretty much from one main point to any other point uh, once the full network of set effect has been achieved. So, um, so there are all sorts of um, possibilities that then emerge from that. Um, so you make, you know, microtransactions, uh, you can do streamed. Uh, payments. Um, so these these are these are all things that kind of open up from there. Um, essentially, you move from a point to point uh, interaction to a um, the network interaction. So hopefully that uh, gives you some basic understanding of the Lightning Network and what what that uh, and what the implications are for that. Uh, still quite a ways away from 
having full adoption, but uh, it's very active development going on in that. And, uh, um, and basically the, the, um, the end result will be essentially instant and uh, close to fetus uh, payments that are very fast and it can then essentially match the capabilities that uh, we currently have in the, in the conventional payment networks. So a couple of things I'll uh, touch on real quick. Um, uh, blockchain technology is, is starting to reach the main culture. There's still uh, mostly a minority that really have even basic understanding. Uh, but that's that's changing as, as things uh, progress and develop. Uh, there's a counterculture because of the the need the, um, of what actually the technology means uh, uh, in uh, comparison to the status quo. Um, but, um, the questions that are being asked is who benefits, who loses, and what are the um, what are the responses from from those respective parties? You know, what's at stake? Um, there are coins that are specifically kind of used by the uh, kind of culture movement, which include Monero, um, V2 being sort of a blockchain version of V2, Zcash, uh, Skycoin is a, even a more um, um, far reaching, it's basically considered a third generation uh, um, blockchain technology. And it would replace even service providers. Uh, so it, um, it's progressing quite uh, quite significantly. And there are influencers uh, that have been around and have contributed and sort of set uh, some recognized and some controversial leadership as well. Uh, uh, you know, personalities like uh, the Jeff Berwick from Dolby Gelanti, John McAfee, who was the inventor of the Lee McAfee, antivirus software, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, who is an author of the Internet of Money, uh, and is a uh, pretty uh, um, well known speaker on that. And just a uh, last note uh, with uh, respect to to cryptocurrencies and uh, Skycon in particular, it's actually caught the attention of the UN to because of its uh, because of its uh, third, in fact, it's a third generation uh, um, technology, and it's it has sort of uh, encapsulated a um, incorporated into the vision that the uh, UN has for uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, it's also um, a tool for social justice and uh, self-serving identity, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and it has, uh, and that will be uh, probably a topic for another session at some point. All right, good. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll talk to you soon.